My full name is Sung Won Park, and I was born in Seoul, South Korea. And I, I am part of Gen X, which no one really knows about us, but you know, we, we're here. <laughs> I grew up attending Korean church, like a lot of Korean Americans have. You know, I spent all my summers in the church. I spent all my free time in the church. I was in the church band, served as, you know, like the president, all of that, right? And I grew up with all these kinds of, I don't know what you call it, um, kind of otherworldly experiences. I mean, I had prophetic dreams since I was a little kid. And I also had severe sleep paralysis um, since I was a little child, which was very terrifying. And when I, did, when I remember when I was sharing um, the fact that I, I had sleep paralysis with my parents when I was about um, six or seven, and they told me it was because my faith is weak, so the, the devil's trying to get me. And so I was like, mm, I don't want the devil to get me. So I just stopped telling them about these experiences. And at a certain point, you know, like other things started happening. I started to hear voices and I started to see things and I thought maybe I was being touched by the Holy Spirit. You know, that's how I interpreted it. By the time I reached a certain age, I felt like, oh, I can't run away from this any longer. I must have a calling, you know, to, to serve as a minister. And there are several ministers in my family on both sides. And so I just felt like that was the natural kind of trajectory for myself. And so I went to, uh, I went to seminary. I got my divinity degree. I was under care at a church um, to become ordained and I, toward the end of my seminary, um, I, my father passed away suddenly, and I found myself not knowing what to do for him. I wanted to honor him and memorialize him in, in a certain way, and I found that I didn't know how because both sides of my family stopped you know, practicing traditional ways because the church told them that they're, they're not supposed to do that as Christians. And so I slowly became resentful of the church and um, resentful of being severed from our tradition and our practices. And I've always kind of struggled around my identity as a Korean and Korean American. And then, you know, the, the queer thing came and then that also then um, put a distance even more. For them, it was like, oh, you can't be Korean and be queer, right? Because that's like an American thing or white people thing. Um, and so, you know, there were all these factors like leading into like me always questioning my identity as a Korean American person. So, you know, when my father passed and I didn't know what to do, that added to my sense of not knowing who I was or like not having our, our, our people's practice, right? Like ancestral practice was completely lost to me and, and I became very resentful of it. And so um, my studies kind of like took a turn into looking at generational trauma um, as a result, direct result of Christian imperialism and severance from our traditions. And what does that do to our people? Like the feelings of disembodiment, you know, the, the feelings of what being lost, um, you know, not really having um, a firm standing. I think especially for those, in, those of us in the diaspora who are always questioning, you know, are we Korean enough? Um, that it's, it just really kind of struck home. And I remember the clear moment when I got a job offer to, um, at the church that I was under care at, my heart just sank to my stomach, like immediately. And I was like, okay, I think this is a clear sign. And so I, I left, I left the church. And then I spent a few years just kind of wandering around, I guess, um, and not really thinking about it and wondering if I can find um, practitioners in, in Musok, right? Because I naturally then turned to Musok because I was like, that is our indigenous practice. That is, that is our, our ancestral right. And so I went, I got a reading. I was told a lot of things and I met um, the Mudang who is now my spirit mother. I was told, uh, oh, you're coming from a line. And I was like, mm, a line of what? 
And they were like, no, no, there are practitioners in your, in your family. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking. I, I literally, I think that I started sweating and I started, sh like, I was just like, my voice started shaking because I was like, no, no, that's not possible. I was like, I, we have pastors on both sides. This is not, you know. And the way that I was told was that, yeah, it's because you guys have, you know, you, your families are spirit touched, right? But because of Christian imperialism, we, you know, they have been directed in the wrong way. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> and so I ran away from it for a few, a couple of years. Um, and then one day, um, things just started escalating. Everything just got kicked up. You know, like I hadn't had sleep paralysis in, in a number of years and that started happening again. I started hearing voices, you know, I started seeing things and everything was just kind of like hitting me all at once from every angle. And I was just like completely overwhelmed. And I was like, okay, I just need to do this. Everything just fell into place. All the crazy shit that happened in my life, all the like fucked up things that I thought I saw and heard that, that, was, that was a sign of me either being taken by Satan, um, it just all made sense. Everything just kind of fell into place. It felt like all the puzzle pieces that had been just kind of floating um, without a place just kind of fell and just started to give me like, it started to show me in the whole picture. And everything just made so much sense that it wasn't really even a question. And then later that year, when I was still 42, toward the end of that year, I actually went to um, the person who is now my teacher and spirit mother and asked her to take me in as her student. I did not think in, the, in my wildest dreams that this is who I was gonna become. I don't know if I would actually say happy necessarily. I just, um, I feel complete. I just, I, I, I feel I'm fully settled into myself. There's like a, like a layer or depth of, of self that I just kind of like settled into that I just, yeah. The queer joke for me, it's actually been a lot of my closest people are um, not queer. I think they actually have shown me what it means to hold someone who is trans and one of the first people who, I don't, I don't wanna say I'm the first, but like I don't know of other trans men, Korean trans men who, who are around my age or even a couple of years older. And it's really been my friends who have really held me through that process. And to me, that's kind of the joy is that they don't have to be queer, right? Or they don't have to be trans in order for them to hold me and to affirm who I am. And um, a lot of my straight, you know, cis male friends, right? Who have also shown me, and they probably don't even know that they, they were doing this, right? That, you know, just kind of like them being co comfortable in their own skin has shown me what it means to be, you know, also a trans man. All the things that, that I used to like think about, like, oh, I can't be too emotional, I can't be too um, expressive, I can't be, you know, like all this other stuff. Like, you know, when I see them, they're just like, they're crying at like the drop of a hat, you know, like they cry at TV commercials. They're like all over their kids because, you know, they're, they love them so much and, you know, they're just, so expressive and so in their bodies that that's what I learned from them. And so for me, the joy comes from just being able to learn from my friends, but also just by being in relationship to them, that, that it affirms who I am. My best friend that I went to college with, she has a, a very large extended family and they've really kind of completely taken me in. So I used to spend a lot of the holidays with them. And I remember one year, this was maybe like 20 years ago, I was having a conversation with her and I said, listen, I don't know how your family's gonna handle me being trans because, you know, obviously she's known for a long time and they've just seen me as like a tomboy, you know, or, you know, whatever, however they wanted to make sense to them. That's how, we never obviously talked about it, but so I said, I don't know how it's gonna go, so maybe I just won't come anymore. And then it was about a month before, um, Things taking, and I showed up to the family dinner, and every single person had changed their pronoun. So instead of saying she, they had every single one of them had 
changed um, their addressing of my pronoun as he. And so I think, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm so grateful um, to have people who have, you know, just naturally like taken on a role to like, like I know that that was her way of like showing me that she cared and that she sees me, right? And for her to like talk to all the elders in the family, you know, and they're all boomers, right? And every single one of them had like changed their pronoun. And I, you know, to this moment, I just, I don't think that, I don't think that I'm ever gonna forget that ever. And just in terms of how, um, I think also, you know, them being a Korean immigrant family, you know, had a huge impact in how they just embraced me in that way. I, I don't know of any other um, Korean American trans person who is a mudang. And I'm not really sure if there is significance in that. I feel like there is. I haven't really quite found that yet. Um, but I do think about that a lot. And I do think that actually, um, after being initiated and after really coming into Musok, um, I have, I feel like I've, it, it's been kind of like a second homecoming into the queer, um, especially into the queer Korean American community. Um, and yeah, I've, yeah, I've just been thinking a lot about what that means. I think that looking back on it now, um, I want to be more intentional in terms of um, being in community with younger folks because we were probably one of the first waves of people in the Korean American community to, you know, to use the word queer and, you know, to be out. Um, and so I think what I have been really f focusing more on is about making us accessible to some of the younger folks. Um, also letting them know that there is a history in our communities now, right? Like we have history now, right? Like as Korean Americans, we have history and we have precedent and we have all the things that I think younger folks can use as a resource. So I just, I just hope that I can be one of those resources. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and she sounds like a little harabaji. <laughs>